That's so true, and our praying won't be over, even if the elections turn out the way we want them to be, because I will tell you that our country is in imminent danger. It is from fiscal collapse, from enemies within, and enemies from without. And it's gonna take a lot of courage. And speaking of courage, the lady that we have speaking today, Kathy Adams is a friend of mine. I think Kathy and I have known each other about 20 years. We used to have a local chapter of Texas Eagle Forum and I was, I, that's how I got involved with Eagle Forum. I was on the board and I actually received the God and Country Award from Phyllis Schlafly, the grand dom of conservatism uh, one year and I cherish that very much. Kathy Adams has been fighting for you and for me, for our children and for our grandchildren, long before some of us ever knew there was a problem. Kathy Adams has given so much of her time, and her precious husband, Homer, has given so much of his personal resources to fund Kathy to go all over the United States, all over Texas, and actually attend many, many, many United Nations meetings. Kathy is an authority on the evil that the United Nations represents and the threat to liberty. Kathy Adams, as I said, was a conservative woman before it was cool. You know, Kathy, some of us were, were there a long time ago, and Kathy certainly before me. But I will tell you that I respect Kathy very, very much, and I look forward to being a co-bulldog with her in Austin this next session. today uh, a review of Ameritopia, uh, and that is a book written by a great patriot, Mark Levin, and I don't know about you, but I love the way Mark just lays it on the line. That's right. Kathy, welcome back. You know, it's not too often that we get to brag about being bulldogs and wearing lipstick. And it is so fun. The day that Joanne and I and three or four other women traversed a part of Texas with the Ted Cruz campaign was one of the highlights of my life. And hearing each lady go to a microphone and defend their families, their faith, what they believe should be happening in, in the public square was an honor just beyond words. We call ourselves, instead of the steel magnolias, Ted's Tulips. <laughs> it was a fun day. But anyway, um, thank you so much for being here today. And um, wow, what a man to follow. And um, I'm so glad that he got all of us warmed up. Um, and we don't need that, but anyway, that's OK. Um, Ameritopia is Mark Levin's most recent book. And some of you, I know, heard me even speak about Liberty and Tyranny, another one of his books. Of all of the talk show hosts, I enjoy Mark Levin because he is a teacher and he is a constitutional scholar. A man who, of course, worked in the Reagan administration. So, Ameritopia is the name of his newest book. And as we move on to the next slide, um, we see that um, what Mark Levin does is take us back to our founding, and once we establish that and the dangers to our founding ideals, then he discusses the utopias that have been about the world since even predating Christ. And after that, then he talks about how America got on the slippery slope, referring to four presidential um, men, four men who were presidents of this country, and then closes with some numbers to show economically how effective those policies have been in destroying the American ideal. And so with that, let's look at James Madison, whom we know was the primary author of the United States Constitution, a man who was a great scholar himself, and he said, but what is government itself? but one of the greatest of all reflections on human nature. So what we see going on in society today, folks, is a reflection of who we are. And that is a soul-searching 
ideal. As a matter of fact, when I point a finger out, I see three of them coming back at myself. And so let's check our own hearts first. That's what Second Chronicles 4, uh, uh, 714 is all about. If my people, who is he talking about? Those people down the street, those heathens that don't attend any worship service? No, it's us, the believers. We have got to look at ourselves. So he says that government is a reflection, the greatest of reflections on human nature. And he said the greatest difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the second place, oblige it to control him itself. Do we have a government under control? No. Pastor Cummings, I think what he had to say is basic. In the attack, the war that has been happening at least over the past four years, but I thought it was very interesting how he dated it back to LBJ. So it's been going on longer. It just took a long time for it to get to the culmination that it is today. So um, with that, I have to show you a caution. So we have this reflection of human nature. We know that we are um, fall, uh, fallen people. But Joseph Story, one of our US Supreme Court justices, had this caution. He said, governments are not always overthrown by direct or open assaults. As a matter of fact, Republican republics, which is when we pray, or pray, pledge to the United States flag, it is to the what? The republic, that's right. So we are a republic, and he is warning us way back in the, our uh, nation's founding. He said, there is often a concealed dry rot which eats into the vitals, which all, when all is fair and stately on the outside, we're still the lone superpower. We're still the greatest economy. But folks, there is a dry rot. And I think that you have heard much about it from the constitutional perspective, from the faith perspective, and certainly the economic perspective. But oh my, we cannot forsake also the link that is indelible between moral and fiscal <coughs> issues. Because the more the cornerstone of our society, families, are broken down, the more that parent-child relationship is broken down, the more the government tries to fill the gap. And it can't do it. And we cannot afford it. So it behooves us to have a strong moral as well as economic foundation. Utopianism, obviously the work, the uh, title even, Ameritopia, and the work of this book is talking about another kind of utopia. And um, it is anti-constitutional to even think of a utopia. Let's look at the contrast very succinctly. A utopia requires unlimited power, a central authority, and it legislates without end. By contrast, the US Constitution divides, disperses, and delineates government power. What a contrast. <coughs> It always devolves into tyranny. Utopianism relies on deceit. It denigrates into the law of the jungle. It attracts fanatics, not statesmen. And utopianism, I believe, can be succinctly stated in Barack Obama's world as sustainable development. Some of you heard me talk about Agenda 21. That is the green agenda. That is what he has been using for the past nearly four years to destroy the American con economy. And we're going to see the numbers resulting from his policies in a few moments. The green agenda is three things. It's social, economic, and environmental equity. Those are the new Marxist terms. If you hear economic equity, then you've got to know that that is a Marxist theory. They also call it economic justice. They also call it social justice. And I can promise you that your children are being taught about social justice and economic justice and environmental justice in their classrooms. It's very tragic what is going on. That is Barack Hussein Obama's utopia, the green agenda. It comes out of the UN. Yes, it does. 
come out of the United Nations for sure. There's always a mastermind, as Mark Levin refers to them. They're also um, called bureaucrats or czars. We now, as we know, have men and women who are appointed by Barack Hussein Obama that did not have to go through the scrutiny of the United States Senate. They are totally outside any constitutional provision. They have budgets to deal with. We don't even know what we are paying for, and we don't know how much we are paying. Totally outside the U.S. Constitution. We don't need czars, and we don't need masterminds. So let's look at the first historical utopian ideal called the ideal city by none other than uh, Plato's Republic and the Perfect Society in that book, 380 BC. So we can see for centuries that these wrong-headed ideas have been out there. But this was a fictional, and all of these are fictional, and I will be presenting um, uh, four of them. There have been attempts to, uh, to implement them, and every one, of course, has failed. The first was the ideal city, and it did create a totalitarian state. And uh, they had a class system of three different classes of people, gold, silver, and bronze, like we're at the Olympics, right? And they, um, the philosophers were the gold class. Of course, why? Because Socrates is the one who is creating this, and he is going to lift himself up. This is what all of these do. They create um, classes of people and those in, with the most power and those who have the most um, marbles are the ones who have the most um, say in society. The auxiliaries are, are the guardians and they are the warrior class. And you know throughout history, if there is a dictator who gets into power, then he uses the military in order to enforce his own laws and rules. And the third are the bronze people. Those are the producers. In other words, they are slaves. He us uh, um, go ahead to the next slide. Um, he also focused on destroying the nuclear family. And I think that this is a very sad commentary, but you will see a lot of cor corollary to what's going on in our own societies. Parents treat their children as contemporaries. I even know of a teacher couple who taught their sons to call them by their first name instead of mom and dad. And that is teaching your children to be contemporaries. And of course, the teachers flatter their students. Anyone heard of the self-esteem movement? You know, I mean, this is what they are doing. And of course, the students in return do not respect their teachers, nor do they respect their parents. And Karl Popper was a critic of Plato's Republic. And um, as you see, he, he passed away not that long ago. But he said that Plato is hostile to individualism. That is the uniqueness about America. And what he said is this individualism, united with altruism, has become the basis of Western civilization. And look at this. It is the central doctrine of Christianity. Love your neighbor, not love your tribe. Isn't that a contrast? And then the second of these ideals or uh, utopias is actually called Utopia. This was by Thomas More. And um, again, let me say that I know that there are many people who refer to Plato and uh, come up with different ideas and, and not all of them are sounding bad in the beginning, but we are looking at the system of Utopia. And uh, Thomas More is not uh, exempt from that same uh, critic, uh, criticism. And Thomas More was a British barrister, and um, he had a make-believe um, traveler in his uh, document that contends that a society which, in which every need is answered and every want is met results in a near-perfect existence. This is really sustainable development because on the, in the, uh, the entire continent of Africa, at last count, I think there were 15 wars that were ongoing in Africa. And yet, the United Nations has been for years, as well has been uh, the UK, and I remember um, uh, much of the American foreign policy uh, being focused on Africa. 
We've got to meet the needs of the people in Africa and then there will be no more war. Folks, 15 wars last time, like, time I counted. The way that they are going to get out of a warring situation is to turn their hearts toward their creator. It is not going to be by having their needs met by any government. In Moore's Utopia, it also destroyed individual sovereignty and free will. There was a passport required to travel. There was no private property. Money was evil, so therefore they gave it no value. There was free health care, and that is consistent with Utopia and uh, the ID Ideal City, and the next one we'll see Leviathan, as well as Marx and Engels, um, the last one that we'll be looking at. There is free health care, but look what is a a, a continual, constant match with free health care. Suicide is recommended. The death panels that we now have associated with Obamacare are real. It comes down to what value do you as an individual have to the state, whether or not you get health care. The state of Texas has the most liberal of laws. We have worked for the last three sessions to correct this very fatal error in Texas law. And there has been a pro-life group out of Austin, Texas that has fought us at every turn. Literally bringing in a Catholic priest in order to testify, in order to kill the bill. Today, you have at the point that the death panel within an existing hospital decides they will no longer give you medical care and no longer give you food and water. You have 10 days from the time that they make that declaration to get out of that hospital. And that includes weekends, folks. And so if you are declared no longer fit for their services on a Thursday then you've got a weekend coming and already you're up to five days. Your, ha your time is halfway up by the time you hit the next Monday when you can probably just begin to try and find another place for your loved one. There are people in the state of Texas who are even writing notes saying, I want to live, don't kill me. And the death panel in the hospitals are dismissing them. And you can find this documented on the Texas Right to Life website. And I encourage you to go there and also to sign up on a sign-up sheet that is going around. And I promise you, I will keep you informed and involved on this issue during the next legislative session. And for those of you who are supporters of Texas Alliance for Life and Joe Poyman, this is not a personal attack on Joe Poyman, but ask him why he continually kills this bill. I think that he deserves the challenge. So, um, then we have the third of these utopias by Thomas Hobbes, and his is called Leviathan. He was another Englishman, and he hated wars. And he believed if a utopia could be created, then um, that uh, there would be no common power, there would be no law, and with no law, there would be no injustice. Oh, yeah. In other words, he makes himself king, dictator, the whole thing. And um, at the next slide, we will see that there were 11 rules that, um, that Hobbes created for his Leviathan. Subjects, that's you and me, cannot change the government. Ooh, I wouldn't operate very well in that kind of a utopia. And subjects are never free. The minority must consent to the sovereign's actions. He can do whatever he wants, and we're supposed to just compliment him for it. I think we're seeing a lot of that right now with Barack Hussein Obama. Yeah. You know, the fact checking after that last debate showed three huge lies. Has he been held to account? No. The subjects and the media are giving him a pass and patting him on the back and even saying he won the debate. How can you win anything with a lie? It's going to catch up with him eventually. It's got to catch up. And I think you and I are going to make sure it's on November 6th. He's out of here. We are blamed if the sovereign injures us. You know, the devil made me do it. Oh, those people made me do it. And the sovereign is the sole judge. 
Um, the seventh of his, uh, his rules is that he has the whole power. He also controls the judicial system. Hmm. You know what, folks? If we do not change presidents, we're going to get more Kagans and more Sotomayors, and our country would be set back for 40 or 50 years. We cannot do that. We cannot do that to our judicial system, and that is where we are headed if Barack Hussein Obama is reelected. Um, the uh, sovereign is the commander in chief, but you and I are taxed to pay for all of that, of course. And uh, right now, if, don't, didn't you think there's another interesting point in the debate? He said, well, Mitt Romney wants to not cut the military budget. And, and you know, I, of course, Mitt Romney said he's only wanting to cut a trillion dollars out of the military budget and cited real reasons, which you just heard the mocking, rightly so, from Ted Cruz of the use of bayonets that we have more employed today than we did back in our nation's founding. Um, but a trillion dollars, and then Barack Hussein Obama defends that position by simply saying, and the military isn't asking for more. Folks, anybody with a brain in their head in the United States of America knows that if that military brass stood up against their commander in chief, they'd be out of there. They know it. I mean, it is wrong for him to get by with these locks. It is wrong. And um, I'm, I'm ashamed of our me mainstream media. Um, but he, the sovereign, bestows all honors, punishments, according to his own laws. And we are seeing too much of a move in America going in that direction, of course. The Communist Manifesto is the last of the utopias that we'll look at. And I think that probably most of the people in this room did not look at it as being a utopia, but that's exactly what it is. And uh, Mark Levin was so insightful in order to draw our attention to that. But anyway, of course, its entire emphasis is on class struggle. That's why we have class warfare going on today, because who is a Marxist in our White House? Of course, it's Barack Hussein Obama. And I don't know why we're not calling him what he is as a Marxist. It's as if when the wall fell, that communism died. It didn't. Today, it is green on the outside and red on the inside. It is as red as ever, and Barack Obama is implementing his green agenda, which is Marxism, and that is exactly why our economy is hurting as badly as it is, and why 23 million people are still out of work. That is exactly what we're talking about. And of course, it is the, um, the bourgeois or the capitalists against the proletariat or the workers, and that is his ideal world, where he would be king and all of us would be his subjects. And, um, you know, it, it's all about me. This man is, um, is worse than, than what has hit this country before. But again, as Joseph Story warned, something can look very good and very strong and very healthy on the outside, but you get a dry rot on the inside. And this is it. This is the philosophy that is bringing us down. It isn't from without. It's not a warring army at our, our borders. Instead, it is with, from within. And we put that man in office. Did you hear about the new ad paid for by the Barack Obama campaign that is out as of today, a woman who is making a sensual statement that her, and I, I'm sorry, but this is part of the ad, so I'm gonna use the word, that she is going to give up her virginity in the voting booth for Barack Obama. That is what he is paying for in this campaign. That's what he's paying for. And who is he targeting? This is gonna be on all those loosey-goosey kind of uh, radio and TV ads where young people are going to be enticed. And I just, I think that it is beyond the pale that we have a man of that low character in our White House. Um, so what are the, the communism's 10 tenets? The first five are, of course, abolishing private property. What is the number one item on the green agenda? Abolish private property. The second is a progressive income tax. Oh yeah, we're gonna spread the wealth around, we heard before, and now it's like, well, how can you say he's gonna be increasing taxes? All he's going to do is close the loopholes. Folks, he says very clearly himself, he's gonna tax the rich more. The job creators are going to be taxed into oblivion if he remains in the White House. Abolish all the right of inheritance and destroy the nuclear family. Abolish religion and morality. Phyllis Schlafly has even got a new book out about his war on people of faith, his war on religion, and it is very much documented. 
He has gone even into Catholic universities and demanded that the crucifix be covered so that it doesn't distract him or distract from him. You know, he's more important than Jesus, is what he's saying. Um, it centralizes property, it centralizes credit in the hands of the state, and what have we have seen with the uh, takeover of banks, we've seen um, the, the takeover of major industries, which is point number seven. Um, the communications and transportation are taken over <coughs> under state control. The people in Harris County and Houston, Texas have voted again and again and again against mass, mass transit, against their rail system down there. And during the next legislative session, we're going to have a big push for rail sy system in Texas. Speed rail, speed to high speed trains. And are the people clamoring for this? No. But there are people who want to make a profit at your expense. And that's what they're going to go after. And it's part of a philosophy that is foreign to our way of thinking. It is not a republic. It is not a constitutional um, uh, 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 ideal that can be upheld constitutionally. And labor equality, in other words, unions, and if this man has his way, I can promise you that he is going to um, have his, uh, uh, his way with mandating that unions um, are in there and they, they will eliminate the secret ballot uh, within voting in unions. Um, he's uh, in the, the uh, auto bailout, which is really the auto takeover. Who profited from that? Nobody except for who? The unions. They were the only ones to profit from that. And then they move people to eliminate town and country. And we know with the green agenda, they move people into urban areas. And Barack Obama has even issued an executive order in order to attack 16% of the American people who live in rural America. And so he's very much moving us into a pack and stack kind of housing in rural, in, pardon me, in urban, urban areas in order to um, rewild America. Why? Because his obedience is to the creation, not the creator. You see, these people think in the green agenda that the earth is holy, rather than it being a creation of the creator. They do not worship him. They worship themselves. And they believe that they are doing a righteous thing when they leave the earth um, to return to its original state, which God will take care of all that, of course. Um, and then free education for all children, and all history is a history of class struggle. That is the Marxist agenda. Um, and when you look at um, Americanism, it is the antithesis of everything that our founders believed. And um, let's consider now the thinkers of the Constitution and of the um, Declaration of Independence. Who was it that our founders studied? What was their thinking? And who formed their, their thinking? Who shaped it? We know that the Bible was a primary source of influence to our founders. And John Locke was one of the major authors that they studied. And what did he study? The nature of man. And what did he dis uh, discover about them? That an individual has value, dignity, and significance. Why? Because men are God's workmanship sent in his, uh, is sent to serve at his pleasure. That is the purpose of our being. And um, all individuals are granted by God inalienable rights. And I think that Ted Cruz covered that so beautifully. We are granted um, rights not from the government, but from our God and guaranteed by him. And his influence on the Declaration of Independence, just look at some of the wording, which is so amazing. Government must uphold and secure man's inalienable rights, be conformable to the laws of nature. Government must be formed and, uh, by and established with the consent of the governed. The government must, must be free of corruption and it must constrain itself. That was all John Locke's thinking. The um, other thinker that was one of the major influencers of our founders was Charles Montesquieu. And um, he uh, said that the law that impresses on us a creator and thereby leads us toward him is the first of the natural laws in importance. And what he is really making as he elaborates in the book about the point that he is making 
is that how in the world can someone with any title, you know, I'm president of Texas Eagle Forum. You know what that gives me? It gives me a whole lot more responsibility to my creator to serve his people. And that is how I see my role. And I don't care what role that God puts me on or in, that is exactly what I'm to do, is serving him. And then he is going to make sure that his people are cared for. And so for us to elect a U.S. Senator or to elect a president who thinks more of himself than he ought, who thinks so narcissistically, as Barack Hussein Obama glared at Mitt Romney in that last debate, I was so offended, I wanted to go up and just smack his face. <laughs> was so spiritually based in his thinking that he said that there are really three different kinds of government. And um, the Republican form of government, which again is what we are as Americans, we're not a democracy, that's mob rule. Our founders called democracy mob rule. Um, we are a republic and it requires a virtuous people. So the more that our society breaks down morally, the more that we have presidents with such immoral acts as what he has paid for the, by the Barack Obama for president campaign, the more he is deliberately breaking down the morals in our country. The monarchy requires less uh, virtue and the despotic government, of course, um, virtue is not at all necessary. Um, anarchy is when virtue ceases and one was free under the laws, one wants to be free against them. And without virtue, the, republic, the republic's strength is no more than the power of a few citizens and the license of all. And folks, we've got to be very careful about saying, well, that's not for me, but you can do whatever you want. Folks, we have a rule of law, we have a constitution, and those things must be upheld. We cannot think that, well, if what they're trying to do, for example, right now on a ballot in Colorado is legalize marijuana. And if we legalize it, will we empty out our jails? And will we be safe forevermore? No. I'm telling you, Barack Hussein Obama has got to have a teleprompter because he fried his brain on drugs. I mean, it doesn't work. Montesquieu's influence on the Constitution, I think, is very profound. It was his thinking that established the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government, as well as something that we are so um, spoiled with as Americans, enumerated um, uh, powers. And so we are, we are blessed beyond measure, and we can thank Montesquieu for his influence. Then there was a man who came after our founders established this Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, and, um, and we know who they studied in order to establish those. Locke and Montesquieu were two of the primary authors, but then we had an observer, and that was Alexis de Tocqueville, and he authored this book called Democracy in America, and he warned us, he warned us, because one of the strongest things that Mark Levin addressed in both of his books is about equality. Equality, because you know, inequality is a good thing. Because we are all individuals. We are not clones. We are not tribal materials. We are individuals, and we celebrate that. And um, on, the, on the other hand though, we have in the human heart is a depraved taste for equality, which impels the weak to want to bring the strong down to their level and which reduces men to preferring equality and servitude to inequality and freedom. Folks, I will choose my middle class position any day and have liberty and freedom than I would servitude and be promised more from the government. That is what de Tocqueville was warning us when he looked at the American system. And so many have also said, and, and you, may, you, you probably are familiar with this, that America's form of government will work, work fine until, until the people learn that they can vote for themselves more largesse. And that is what we are seeing when we have more than half of the people now who are paying no income taxes. Of course, they want to go out and vote for anybody who's going to grow more government. What's it to them? 
is costing the other guy. I live in the city of Dallas, and I can tell you the southern sector goes out and votes for bonds. They vote for all kinds of extra spending. Why? Because they don't pay for it. The people in the north end of the town are the ones who have to pay for it. It's not working well. Um, then, our slide into statism, into this kind of utopia, began with Woodrow Wilson, remember the League of Nations? And at that time, the American people were so astute that they said, uh-uh, we know that the Bible talks about a one-world government someday, and that's what you're trying to get us into, and no thank you. And then there was FDR, then there was LBJ, and now Barack Hussein Obama. Let's look at them individually. It was Woodrow Wilson who was the one who had the first bright idea that rights were awarded or denied by the government. It was Woodrow Wilson. The government is your provider and your protector. It is not the creator. Instead, it is the government. And then the second was FDR. And uh, this man was so full of himself, he even came up with a second Bill of Rights. And let's see what those were on the next slide. A job. If the government guarantees you a job, you know what? It's going to tell you what job you're going to have. And it's going to tell you where that job is going to be. It's going to tell you how much you're going to make. So you want government to guarantee you a job? Look out. Or that you earn enough. And that you have a decent living for farmers. And of course, back in his day, we had a much uh, bigger agrarian economy. And freedom from unfair competition for every business. How in the world is the government going to do that? Well, Barack Obama's trying it, isn't he? He's trying it. A decent home. Yeah. And then the government tells you what home you're going to have, how much you're going to pay for it, how big it's going to be. And that is very much a part of the green agenda, as we've talked about the stack and pack kind of um, culture in Agenda 21 and the green agenda, the green economy. And then, of course, um, uh, security and old age and a good education. And I have to tell you, folks, that when FDR came up with the whole Social Security idea, people in America were as opposed to it as they are to Obamacare today until they were taxed for years, year in and year out with the Social Security tax, and then they began thinking, I'm paying into this, I should get back what I paid into it. But today, we have people taking who are not giving. My mother passed away last year, and the federal government kept sending my dad her check. So I went with him, took him down to the Social Security office in Dallas. My father was the only person with gray hair in the room. We had to wait for over an hour. There were people who did not speak English. You talk about a system that is broken, folks. This is a system that is broken, and it is going bankrupt, and this is why. Yep. Um, and then you look at the USSR's fundamental rights. You've got a right to work. You've got a right to rest and leisure. Ooh, do you know there are only two countries in the world who have not embraced the UN Treaty on the Rights of the Child? And we are one of those two nations. The other one is Somali, of all places. And you know why? Because there are, is a right in there for a child to have rest and leisure. How do you even define that? And the essence of that treaty is to break down the relationship between the parent and the child, and it's doing a good job around the world. So this is a global issue, not just a state issue. But this is right out of the USSR. And um, maintenance and old age, of course. You know, all the Social Security, Medicare, all the Medicare drug package. Don't we just love that? I mean, we got guys on both sides of the aisle, folks, who've been messing around with our pocketbooks and a right to a free education. These are out of the USSR. How in the world did we get on this slippery slope? And you're saying too much of it. And now Mark Levin warns about Ameritopia becoming more and more into these kind of utopian ideals. Well, I'll vote for that because that gives something to me. Is it constitutional? Is it not? How about starting there instead of what's good for me, myself, and I? So um, I think it's also very interesting and wonderful that a Jewish man has gone back to our Judeo-Christian roots in order to point out these wonderful truths. He says, America has been transforming from a society based on God-given inalienable rights, protective of 
individual and community sovereignty to a centralized administrative statism that has become a power unto itself. Federal spending, as an example, look at in 1930, federal spending was 3.4%. And just as Ted Cruz just told us today, that our spending now exceeds our gross domestic product. Folks, that's a scary position to be in. It's not sustainable. We can go to the next slide. And uh, you look at Social Security and Obamacare, and uh, we know that it's, it's costing jobs, it's costing uh, billions of dollars. We also know that Medicare and Social Security are set to go bankrupt. And I have to really give it to Mitt Romney for choosing Paul Ryan as his running mate. A man who went right into the center of the argument. I think that showed a lot of courage, and Ashton Orvitz and I were talking about this earlier. It showed a lot of courage on Romney's part to bring in a man who has a solution for the future. You know, instead of more government, um, more promises that are not even possible to begin to fulfill some of these, these promises. And it's wonderful that he brought on a man who has already given uh, security for those who are 55 and older, that things will stay the same, but the people under that age have a choice to make. And that choice may be uh, your own, establishing your own account. One where the government won't be pilfering it and misspending your money. I would like for that money not to be laundered by the federal government, but for us to be able to do it. And um, this is a statement right out of, of Levin's writing. He said, 100 years after the publication of Wilson's Constitution, constitutional government, and that is the one, of course, where he said that rights come from the government, not from the creator. So that was Wilson's part and in the US. And 64 years after FDR delivered his second Bill of Rights speech, presidential candidate Barack Obama declared, quote, we are five days away from fundamentally transforming the USA, unquote. Five days later, he was elected president. Fundamental transformation is his goal, and it is to turn us into a Marxist state. Let me also remind you about Alger Hiss, who wrote that UN charter. Alger Hiss was found out to be a, an undercover Soviet um, apparatchik, and so the entire United Nations system is built on Marxism. And so when we allow those fools to come into our state, and observe our elections, do you think it's for good? Absolutely not. And our next governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, called them to account. Thank God for him. Ronald Reagan said so well what our responsibility is, and that is freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. It must be fought for, and it must be handed down. It doesn't get passed on in the bloodstream. And then he concludes by saying that if we don't do this, then we'll be telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the US when men were free. And we are not going to stand for that. So what can we do? Of course, the first thing is to unelect Barack Hussein Obama. And we have got to elect, at every level, candidates who are like-minded. You know, we got rid, this last election cycle, of five of Joe Strauss's, the Texas House, the Texas five. Right now, there is a move afoot to keep Joe Strauss in that seat. And I just smile in response and say, Go right ahead, make my day. We took out the last five. We'll take out you too if you think that you're going to grow up and, and have this plumb position as another one of Joe Strauss's lieutenants. I'm tired of that kind of political behavior, and I know that you are too. But let's conclude with another Ronald Reagan quote, and I think that this one is 
um, really concise enough to be the entire book in a statement, which Ronald Reagan was so good at. Freedom and dignity of the individual have been more available and assured here, in, he, here than in any other place on earth. Our present troubles parallel and are proportionate to. And when he was talking about this, it was many years ago with Jimmy Carter in the White House. And yet, look at the parallels today. They are proportionate to the intervention and intrusion in our lives that result from unnecessary and excessive growth of government. It is time for us to realize that we are too great a nation to limit ourselves to small dreams. I do not believe in the fate that will fall on us if we do nothing. And as Ted Cruz said, he wants to stand shoulder in shoulder with each of us in this room. And I know that in turn, that's exactly where we are. You know, I love it when they say, come and take it as Texans. But you know what? From what Greg Abbott just did, to what I heard Ted Cruz espousing, to what I'm sensing from the people in this room, we're there and we're there today. You want something, you come and take it because we're standing our ground. Thank you.